welcome everybody to uh, this special edition of uh, Tron Talking Points. I'm here today uh, speaking to David Robery and uh, I hope that it will be a useful conversation uh, for those of us who are listening to learn a bit more about uh, their work in Jos in Nigeria uh, and what it all means to be involved in uh, Bible translation. Now David, um, I've got to rack my brains now going back in time because a very, very long time ago that you were probably, if not the first, but one of the very first that we would have called a ministry apprentice in the Tron. You even was the first. Very the first. Yeah. Even predating uh, Corn Hill. So that really is yep. a long time ago. Um, 2005 to 2005. 2007. Um, and during that time, I think I married you to Julie. Is that right? Was that, yes. What year was that? Yes, uh, that was 2005. 2005. End of 2005. That's right. Just after Christmas, if I remember. Yeah. Um, Julie was on the first year of Cornhill. Yes. Um, and so you've been in at the heart of training for, for, for Bible ministry a long time ago. Um, those who've known you for a long time have followed you beyond that to, to Kenya, where you did postgraduate study looking at um, linguistics. Getting ready for getting Bible ready translation. For Bible translation. Then a bit of time back home. But then you've been serving with Wycliffe in Jos in Nigeria for 12, 12 and a half years. 12 and a half years now. Yeah. So um, you've got a lot of experience uh, in all of that. And uh, we've heard, obviously, lots about it over the years. But some won't know much. Some won't have heard you speak about it. Some, I guess, may be wondering, well, what 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 does it all involve? Mm. Um, and let me just start by asking a sort of provocative question, because sometimes sometimes things that we hear is, um, goodness gracious, we got so many English translations of the Bible. Um, you know, why on earth do we need yet another one? Yeah. Um, and that's not a, an unfair question, mm -hmm. actually, perhaps yeah. uh, for us here. But in somewhere like Nigeria, um, many of us, we've got folk from Nigeria in the con congregation. Many of us will know people from Nigeria, and they might be thinking, well. Don't all Nigerians speak English? Um, haven't they got an English Bible? And then some who might know a little bit more might say, well, yeah, and don't they, a lot of them speak Hausa as well? Is that not a fairly big national language? Aren't there Hausa Bibles in, yeah. in churches? Um, so what what's left to do? If there's Hausa Bibles, English Bibles, churches and all these yes. things, yeah. what are you actually doing? Yes. Uh, if, that's, if that's the case yes. is this just a luxury of a, a nice new version yes, with less these and those or something yes. it's not that is it I know it isn't no, no, but it isn't. You, you tell us No. Uh, so English is the language of education in Nigeria um, although it used to be Hausa in some ways it is now English and so many people who go to school will encounter English um, it, it puts a lot of people off reading and writing uh, to, to start in English. Um, but anyway, there are there are lots of brilliant, very clever people who uh, thrive against the odds uh, with English in Nigeria, and, and many of them uh, leave Nigeria and come here. So it's obviously only the 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 top, the, the smartest, smartest yeah, people who, who we, we get to meet. Yeah, um, sure. And they may not need the Bible uh, in order to have in their local languages to have a better understanding of it. But actually, if you go into the villages and, and the majority of people in towns, um, it, it really is very useful to have people reading and hearing the Bible and, uh, and a great tool for preachers too to have uh, a reliable translation of the Bible in, in people's everyday language, not just a, a language of uh, performance and showing off at school and trying to sort of impress people with, with big long words. Uh, people do that. But so, so, so English is the, is the sort of education language and maybe the sort of, um, I suppose you might say, the language of, to aspire to for the elites. But what yeah. about what about Hausa? Because isn't that, am yes. I not right in thinking? So Hausa, Hausa is a language of uh, wider communication for northern Nigeria. In the south, it, it's a wee bit different. But okay. in northern Nigeria, which is where we are, it's a language of wider communication spread through conquest, um, slave trading and raiding, and conquest of the Hausa Fulani kingdom um, over the last few hundred years before the... British Empire kind of put a stop to that um, and so because of that it, it's interesting that lots of people do speak Hausa it's a language of the marketplace and 90 years ago was uh, chosen to be the language of evangelizing the north of Nigeria lots of mission 
missions got together and they saw this right. opportunity to to plant the gospel across the north of Nigeria using Hausa. So European missionaries, say British missionaries, gone would say we need to use this local language or or this national language yeah. like that's not English, not the not colonialist, but is, yeah. is Hausa, which yeah. which we would think well that's and that, a, that's and that a good makes thing. Sense. Yes, uh, and it, and it's been astonishingly successful in many ways. You've got to say that uh, one reason I think they made that decision was they they realized that there were just countless languages in nigeria Mm -hmm. and it took a long time for people to learn each language to communicate effectively with local people and so they they reckoned we could just speed this up a whole load if we could use house of this language of wider communication across northern nigeria and then maybe in time it will trickle down to a sort of local level. Mm-hmm. And that, that was, I think, very much the thought. Uh, and now 90 years later, you can see that there are churches planted all across the north of Nigeria using Hausa and to some extent English in some places as their language for preaching and teaching and for yeah, reading the Bible together. What then are the... Um deficiencies in that then so why because obviously there must be otherwise you wouldn't yes be doing yes what of you're course doing. so i've given you the the sort of good news there's yeah. a there, there is a the bad news yeah. is that um you've now got people who are very familiar with the gospel in a quite a superficial way um with a kind of churchy house language that they're familiar with but they they don't use house for every aspect of life uh, and and as monolingual people um, it's quite difficult for us to understand that multilingual people which is most of the world may have different aspects of life that they use different languages for so if you end up with a church language which is Hausa which might also be the language of bargaining for your vegetables in the marketplace Mm -hmm. that isn't the language of everyday life in the village it isn't the language of all your uh, most serious fears and uh, hopes and aspirations. You wouldn't have a heart to heart with somebody in 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 that language. Probably not. No, it's right. a bit certain. Certainly, fairly superficial, and really, you're cutting down who who really gets to hear the gospel by by limiting it just to the people who are good in Hausa. And there are so many uh, misunderstandings. Hausa native speakers when they uh, meet people who are speaking Hausa as a second language, uh, realize that sometimes these people just don't understand them. So to an outsider, we can think, oh, Hausa just solves the whole problem. But actually, when you're in that situation, if you spend time getting to know people, you'll discover that Hausa just isn't quite adequate. Uh, that's what a, a catechist friend of mine discovered, which sort of led him into... Bible translation sort of almost back. Tell me about that because I mean this this uh, I can I can see where you're coming theoretically, but what I suppose I want to know is actually in in real life mm. does it make any difference? Yes. Yeah, so um, Benedict, uh, who I got to know some years ago, um, had a a job translating for a missionary in church. So the the missionary um, Irish missionary would preach. And Benedict would have the job of interpreting into Hausa, uh, the language of church, wider communication. And he'd been doing that very well for uh, for many months. When he realized that actually, as he talked to his mother, his other relatives in the church, they just didn't really understand what he was talking about. And... So they understood re- the words, but they couldn't they got, really get them. They got some of the words, yeah. but it just it didn't have any impact. Yeah. Uh, and so obviously he could talk to them about what he had been saying at, at home afterwards, but it wasn't just his relatives. It was most of the congregation. So, so one Sunday he decided, and he's a little timid, he decided that he would be a little bold and be a bit naughty. And instead of translating the sermon uh, and the catechism into Hausa, he used Gwarok. 
um, but he didn't tell the missionary that's what he was doing. He that's just, their local language. That the, was the, the local the, language yeah. um, okay. there for for the town of Kogoro and surrounding areas. He used Gorok language, and after the service, the the missionary came up to him and said, "What did you do?" And Benedict thought, "Now I'm in for it. I, I'm in trouble now. He's gonna he's gonna really tell me off. Oh dear, how do I explain myself?" No, the missionary actually was very excited because he'd seen for the first time everyone really paying attention in a way that they they weren't when they were hearing the English or the Hausa interpretation. When it was in Guarok language, uh, everyone was really paying attention, thinking about what was said in a totally new way. Um, I actually went along a few weeks after this time to to a church service, uh, and and I, I could really tell the difference as well. When hmm. when the teaching was in English, you know, people were there listening. When it was in interpreted into Guarok, people were making all the sorts of usual little noises that in Nigeria people mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. to show that they're paying attention, and that was striking, so striking that that the missionary said. No, from now you were right to do that. Uh, you could have asked me first, but you were right to do that. I want you to do this, interpret into Guarok language every single time because the missionary wanted people to understand the good mm. news. And, and so did Benedict. And, and it was really achieving a lot more than the Hausa okay. had been. And you've, and you've seen other examples of that as well, have you? Yeah, count, so countless, one countless examples. So, yes. so it might be to, to just by way of some sort of analogy, it might be something like the difference between, let's say, a highly academic university professor coming along on a Sunday morning uh, and preaching to an ordinary congregation and actually giving a lecture which might be appropriate for PhD students using all sorts mm -hmm. of words that people kind of understand but don't really. Um, and the difference between that and some plain person turning out the bible verse and yeah. talking in normal language to normal people yes it's, it's, it's that's i mean it's yes. an analogy but it's, yeah. that's what you're saying and, really. and often in in a monolingual culture like, like we have in 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 many parts of the uk uh, we use different registers you know academic register yeah um and then informal register and actually we want the gospel to be saturating every aspect of our life don't we yeah and people using different languages, it, it's an extension of that. So if you've got the Bible and the gospel trapped in only one niche area of life, that's not a good thing for Christian discipleship. Right. So so in other words, it, it, you're learning about things, but it's like you're keeping it in the academic box that is just for exams yeah, yeah, rather you, than this is going to help me tomorrow morning at work or yes. with my family or... or yes, or, uh -huh. which is why you have the situation that you've got people singing in the choir on a Sunday and then on a Monday they're going to the witch dot to, to curse their enemies. And that is just very common. Because the, these are two different spheres different of life. Different spheres of life. And the, one, and the language of the yeah. gospel isn't penetrating into the other yeah. one because it's it's being taught in such a way as it doesn't belong to the rest of life yes okay yes and so that that so that's like a an implicit curriculum you're saying this is just a language of impressing people getting jobs yeah. rich stuff yeah. i see so well that's very helpful so because sometimes i've heard people talk about um the importance of heart language and that kind of thing and I'm not sure that's quite what you're speaking. I've never been terribly persuaded by that because that seems slightly sort of no, I think, emotional I think, and, and not very. But but yeah. that, that's that's something different to what you're talking about. Is that am I right? Yes, there? yeah, I think so. And and I think uh, we we've realised that although that comes close to the truth, actually, if you talk to multilingual people, um, that they, they would have a hard time identifying their heart language, but they would identify that different languages impact their life in different ways, which is why at our church in Joss, whenever we have a, a striking illustration or a joke or something that has to pack a punch, our pastor will always give the punchline in Hausa. 
and then he'll try and explain it in English, but it doesn't really pack as much as a punch. Uh, yeah, see, that's very interesting because I find that when I'm in, in India, DBI, and normally what happens is that uh, th- th- we are doing the speaking in English and um, perhaps Isaac Shaw is interpreting for mm. me. But then sometimes when Isaac does his talk, he's talking in English and somebody else translates for him into Hindi. Yeah. But every now and again, <laughs> whenever, and it's exactly as you say, if he's saying something funny or a joke, he goes into Hindi himself and everybody, everybody laughs. Because Yes, and then and he does that naturally. Yes. But then when somebody explains it in English, it's not funny. So yes. th- 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 there is something there, isn't there, about the connection? Because I mean, you don't really use high fluting academic language for funny jokes yeah, or yeah, massive yeah. impact like that. But sometimes the things that actually are quite piercing are the things which yeah. have to be put in a certain idiom that yes. people can understand yeah. and I mean that's one of the difficulties isn't it we have that obviously translating into yes. in, 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 into the Farsi here and I certainly feel that when I'm in, in yes. uh, I've sometimes in DBI I've said things and then Isaac just laughed because and he'll say well I can't translate that it doesn't it won't make any sense to people yes. and yeah. so, it, so it's not just translation it's actually there's a body of language that, that just doesn't go across like that and yes, and and that's why, and I think the reason that that catechist Benedict um, then started thinking about Bible translation, not just interpreting on the fly, is that he realised that when you're being asked to interpret quickly, you don't yeah. have enough time to consider the very best ways to express what the person's trying to say, and and working on a written translation yeah. gives you that time. So that actually is also helpful because that could be a question. Why don't you just, you know, you, you've got people who are very good at the Bible in the English Bible or the Hauser Bible, but then can't they just preach into the local language? Yes. But what you're saying is they can, but it's much harder. And I suppose mm. that's a bit like how, if I think about when we're doing Farsi translating here, the last few weeks when we had no service here in Bar Street and had some of our Farsi folk in the English service, mm. we made a particular effort to be able to give a full script beforehand to the person translating because they then were able to make their own script and, and, yes. and just do it much better than if it was just on the fly. Yes, um, yeah. because sometimes things will uh, catch you out, um, especially if the original speaker, or in the case of the Bible, the original writer, is trying to do some careful communication yeah. Um, structuring things in a particular way. You may not realize until too late that you've boxed yourself into a corner and it's yep. just all gone wrong. Um, but So if the speaker we, has the text in front of them and the hearer has the text in front of them, then you've yeah. got a common ground you're working from, yes. which is obviously why we have Bibles in church and encourage people to bring yes. Bibles. Yes, and which is also why it doesn't really matter if people have Bibles in different versions um, in church, yeah. because you're hopefully not just preaching the ESV or the NIV, yeah. you're you're preaching this message, and it's not that there's just one correct translation. Each translation gives you a different perspective on the the original, the, yeah. the Greek. Well, of course, for Hebrew some people, original. there is only one one correct translation. Yes, but, <laughs> but um, no, it's good. I absolutely, yes. it's good when people have different because you're able to say, you know, those of you who've got a NIV or a King James will see it says this, and and in this instance, it's more helpful. I mean, one of the things, though, is that um, one of the things you've talked to us about in various occasions is about the lit. So there's a the translation work, but also the literacy work, because yes. there is also the problem, isn't it, that that a lot of these languages are just largely spoken, yes, and not they written. Yes, they all start off spoken. Yeah, and yes. so um, somebody might say, well, <clears throat> you produce a text in this, but people hardly anyone can read it. Yes. Yeah. So what's the point of that? Yes, and. Uh, actually, some people have thought, wouldn't it be a, a better idea just to keep everything oral? And there are some translation projects which start off just doing it, everything orally, uh, and that can have some value. Often, as we're translating, we're actually thinking not just about getting a written text down, but uh, trying to think about how people are going to read it and hear it out loud. But yes, it's a challenge at, at first um, which is why when we launched uh, Luke's Gospel last year, at last, after about 15 years in this Koroashe project, um, we launched not just a, a written book, but um, 
an audio recording along with it, and then we put those together in a, a scripture app that people could um, share for free and download off the internet so that you can see the text and hear it being read well uh, together. But really, actually, we want not just people to be relying on getting one app, but we, we do want to nurture more people to demonstrate good powerful reading so to get lay readers trained up in in churches as well and ordinary people reading the, the yeah. scripture which of course is why it was the reformation by and large in scotland that led to the beginning of schools for yes. ordinary people because the yes. reason was to teach people to be able to read the bible i mean that's the, whole, that's yes. the case all over Protestant read the bible Europe. and 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 then it opens you up to so much more and so if so that's why we we launched at the same time as Luke we launched not just the audio bible but a literacy program as well now tell me about that because um uh you we've talked about this before and i was very surprised uh how, how quickly people can learn another language because because to me the thought of you know it take a very long time to learn another language mm. but you're saying to me that actually if you can put all this together in a multilingual society like that people can learn it very very quickly yes yeah, so we're, we're starting off uh targeting uh people who have learned to read and write hausa yeah um and then we've got just a transition booklet to help them learn how to read and write Ishe language so we're talking targeting this at mother tongue speakers of Ishe language uh, who already know how to read and write in Hausa. And really, you can cover pretty much everything they need to know in a very intensive day or two. See, that's um, astonishing to me. I think people will be very surprised to hear that because yeah. most of us travel away for years and years at school and trying to learn French or something. And, you know, after all these years, it's kind of bonjour. Yes, if well, you're lucky, well, can I have an ice cream? The, the thing is, it makes a difference at their mother tongue speakers of the language. Yeah. And, and of course, so they're not learning a new they're language. Not learning they're, a just new, learning they're just how learning how to read yeah. a new language. Okay, and and, that, and, and 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 I mean, I'm guessing then that language must be much more phonetic than English because we have all sorts of funny spellings you don't know how to pronounce. Yes, and and this is why it is absolutely insane for people to encounter literacy for the first time through through English because the spelling rules for English are crazy it will drive anyone crazy yeah. but then if you're if you've had six seven years of speaking Ishe and then you go to school and you're learning English from someone who isn't a native speaker of English and you're learning to read and write according to the rules of English that is a frustrating experience yeah. that limits education only to a few lucky people um so we hope to start off with this sort of transition from Hausa to Ishe literacy. And then really our, our hope is that kids in the future will learn to read and write mm -hmm. first in their, the language that they've had that foundation years, of, seven years of foundation, um, so that then they can enjoy reading and writing in meaningful language before yeah. they then... I extend to English. So to summarize then you get you get some folk who've learned to read and write in Hauser, they've, they've they've had to do all of that. They speak a different language. You put the Bible or Luke's gospel, whatever it is, in front of them in their own language, and within a day they're actually reading the words, recognizing the words and realizing, oh it makes I, sense. This makes sense and, and it's yes. my language. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately sometimes people think that they should be able to just read and write their language without any instruction at all. And that is hopelessly naive yeah. um, and, and that leads to people writing stuff that they then can't actually read themselves the next day but just with a little bit of attention not 13 years worth of slaving away but just a little bit of attention and if somebody is preaching and teaching in a vivid engaging way in that language in church hopefully that's helping people to say well it's worth reading this yes yeah. and you know i've i've been struck so many times when going to a church service held in Ishe language how much appetite people have for listening to the bible because normally in most churches in nigeria you'll you'll only hear just a handful of verses read and that's because people get bored and switch off quickly um but we've had translators uh demonstrating 
two chapters of the Bible read in the church service, and people don't get bored of it, they don't get tired of it, because it, 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 because it reads smoothly. It, it, reads smoothly. Okay. it makes sense, yeah. you don't get tired of it, but... <laughs> It, if it's if it's difficult language, then you switch off after a while and you get frustrated. So in a way, it, it, it would be a little bit like, again, it's not quite perfect analogy, but if, if we had a long reading in old Elizabethan English, hmm. uh, Chaucer language or whatever, it, it, we'd sort of get it, but you wouldn't want to have too long a reading. Whereas yeah. if it's something that's in much more yeah. up-to-date language that you can understand, that's much, much easier, yeah. particularly for a long part. Yes. I can, this is really helpful because it, 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 it's answering some of the questions I think that I've had and perhaps others uh, might, might conceive of. Here's another one, though. You mentioned, I think, there something like 15 years or whatever to get Luke's gospel done. Yes. Uh, and somebody might say, oh, goodness, you're going to have to live a long time to get the New Testament, <laughs> let alone the whole Bible. Yes. So um, uh, what about that? Because if it takes so long to get one bit of the Bible... Uh, is that efficient, or, or 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 is doing one bit of the Bible giving you much more than just one bit of the Bible? Well, and I think many of the people involved in that translation have a similar thought as well, <laughs> uh, and and they they would have liked to uh, publish it sooner. Yeah. Um, every time we thought it was ready for publication, though, I I realised that no, it it really wasn't, and and it was I think hardest to get the first book out uh, because we were going from we were covering in 15 years what um, has taken what has taken maybe a thousand years for English um, so so yeah. actually we're doing it in relatively short order uh, in terms of uh, figuring out how to express things how to read and write the language um, but we certainly want to speed up and speed up not by being hastier in our translation but by doing a better job uh, and so that that's what we've been continuing in the last year to do some research to find out how people tell stories but the thing is that actually even just having Luke's gospel if that can be taught well and that gives people just a window of clarity uh, in an otherwise sort of blurred vision blurred gospel vision just a little window of clarity for Luke's gospel that can can help make better sense of the rest of it. And of course, when Luke wrote his gospel, um, for probably quite a long time, many of the churches, that was the only scripture they had. Of yes. they had the Old Testament. But, yeah. um, but uh, there's a complete theology of the gospel of Christ yes. within, within one gospel like yes. Luke. And, and I and suppose if people if people really get to grips with that, that will you're hoping that will open up their understanding of of other parts of the Bible, which perhaps they are still reading in a different language. Yes, and I and I think it does everyone a lot better to have a coherent book of the Bible. Yeah. But to encourage people to read the Bible in, in its context, not just grabbing verses, yeah, magical yeah. words and phrases. You do it, you do it well in one place. You then transfer that into into yes. other places. I mean, I think that's probably analogous to to. I mean, often a lot of our foot will have had exposure to or done or even led in uh in christianity explorer yes. because just doing that with mark's gospel yes. um, or have even just seen the mark drama yes. and countless people have said just how helpful it was even just even just seeing the mark drama or or working through mark getting really familiar with that actually transfers a whole lot of skills and a whole lot of understanding to not just the other gospels but actually other books of the bible because you're yes. you've learned a lot how to deal with it yes so that's in fact one reason why we're looking forward to having uh, the mark drama and um, brought to nigeria later on this year we hope and and we look forward to mark's gospel being translated into other languages just giving that a, a coherent basis then to to examine the rest of scripture i i, I think one of the advantages there that looking at a whole book gives you is that it is clear this is this is not just someone's idea from these days from modern times yeah. but we're, this is a reliable message from 2000 years ago and you can see how it all fits together this isn't just someone trying to pull yeah. the wool over your eyes yeah. and so um yes katie is going to be coming over god willing yeah. to to help you 
trained people for That's much drama in, in, yeah. in, in, in October, which is yeah. a, you know, it's been a great blessing <coughs> for us. And obviously she's uh, shared that with, with others around Scotland. But um, it strikes me that particularly where perhaps, um, I want to be careful what I say, but where, where, where the, well, this is true everywhere in the world, but there are, uh, false teachers and mm. where um, often it's uh, the, the, the particular leaders uh, hold quite a lot of influence and sway mm. if if they are you know it is possible isn't it to misuse the bible greatly and is it possible yes, it to is. abuse it and to yeah. just pull verses here there and everywhere make all kinds of false theologies and certainly in in Nigeria, as in other places, there's there's plenty of that going around in the church, yes. the prosperity gospel and so on. One of the things that the translation work is by putting the Bible in its context into ordinary people's hands is it's 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 giving them the Bible on its own terms, not yes. snipped up bits of the Bible to serve somebody else's yes. agenda. Is that is that an important yes, aspect? Absolutely, because it really is striking how God's word being God's word, um, can actually speak even in the hands of unscrupulous teachers yeah. um and and so it that's why it really is worth spending time translating it well so that even in unreliable hands god's word can still pack a punch and and he does speak to people in that way not not just individualistically on people just reading the bible on their own but even in the hands of unreliable teachers, God's word well translated. But it's much harder also for people to abuse the Bible if if everybody can understand what it's really yeah. saying. It's, yeah. in, it's interesting that uh, just like at the time of the Reformation, sometimes people, preachers can be a bit doubtful or, or worried about the Bible being translated into everyday yeah. language because they think, well, you're doing me out of a job then or, yes. or, or I'll be shown up. Um, yeah. Because if I'm teaching something which everyone can see is clearly yeah, you've no, contradicted, you've no need for a special priesthood to interpret it from the yeah. other. Uh -huh. But uh, we're we're trying to make sure that we encourage people. No, no, we're we're not trying to take your job away. We're trying to actually come alongside you. If if you are an honest teacher who really wants to do a good job in God's sight, um, we're here to help you do do your job better by uh, giving you a reliable foundation mm -hmm. of reliable scriptures mm -hmm. and actually even though many of the pastors don't speak the language that their congregation speaks then the translation can fit well in there because if people are reading the bible if you've got a lay reader who can read the bible passage well in the local language even if you're preaching in Hausa or english then the local language translation should reinforce what you're saying and you, you've you've got the lights going on in different different rooms in the house the house yeah. side reinforces the local language we so you're hope. adding you're adding different dimensions to yeah. the understanding not just yeah. a sort of yeah. flimsy structure but something more substantial now i imagine that perhaps um there are, I mean, there must be decisions made as to which projects to get involved in, which languages to use and so on. And I imagine that uh, some who might just like the idea of having a, we've got the Bible bit in our own yeah. language and that sort of thing. How do you make decisions? Because, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be efficient, haven't you? You've got to use your time and resources widely. And, yes. and, and, and yeah. um, how, how does that work? Because I think sometimes you have mentioned there have been times you've pulled out of things because you felt, well, people actually just wanted something to put on their shelf and look good rather than yes. it being used. And, and actually sometimes the the projects have come to an end uh, just because people have been motivated by, by the wrong kinds of things. Uh, I think really the key for us is that there's there's far more opportunity for more need than we can possibly satisfy ourselves even as a, a growing bible translation organization in nigeria but we we're looking to see where people have a a mission motivation uh for using the scriptures and and so if if a community come and they say we'd like 
the Bible translated into our language, we'll uh, meet with them and try to figure out, I mean, how how substantial is this desire? Mm-hmm. Uh, what no, are you actually going to do with it? What are you going to do? Um, do you have people who are going to use this translation? If you just want a book on the shelf, then um, I can help you just design a book to go on the shelf. We won't worry about the contents. Yeah. Um, it's tricky, though, because often people really haven't grasped just how valuable it can be to have the Bible in local language. So you can have people motivated by the wrong kind of desire, kind of civic pride thing, but then when they hear God's word in local language, they can be uh, tr- captivated by the potential there. So I've seen that sort of thing happen. People thinking of this just as a, a luxury and then realizing, no, this isn't a luxury. This is a, a necessity. Um, so obviously that means then that there has to be close uh, cooperation and synergy with with those who are actually wanting to train preachers and bible teachers yes um yeah. because if you nobody to preach it there's there's no point that, that's one reason why i spent um some years getting to know and working with um students at a theological college an hour and a half down the road from joss yeah and we, we did a survey in that that college and found uh, i think about 60 languages Amongst the students, they spoke 60 different languages. 150 Goodness. students speaking 60 languages. <laughs> I mean, that's still only a tenth of Nigeria's languages. But um, that was quite striking. And then uh, through uh, chapels and, and classes with those students, we were able to talk through and, and have helpful discussions about uh what the role of language is in ministry. If you're trying to not just uh, take in lots of collection, uh, not just plant your empire in places, but you're really wanting to have people growing in depth in the gospel, then taking their languages seriously is very important. And so it was very interesting to have several years' worth of, of working through with students on, mm-hmm. on what that's going to mean for their ministry in the future. So, so, so um, again, it, I mean, this business of so many languages is interesting because but what you're really saying is it, it's about taking people's lives seriously. It's, it's yes. The language is not just a means of communication. Actually, it's something more fundamental. It's It's... It's very tied up with who they are and what their lives are about and how they're living their lives. It's 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 yes. not sort of heart language. It's sort of life language in a, yes. in a sense. Yes. So, in a way, it's it, it's no different to saying, well, you go and do ministry in this different culture. You you've got to take that people's culture seriously yes. and. and 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 communicate in a way that make means something in their whole world view and yes. the orbit and so on and and we recognise that yes. here don't we we don't yeah. go and use uh, you know we, we, you, you, you use appropriate language and yes. you don't use the same language of the university chapel as you do in the in in maybe a housing scheme or something yes. because it's, 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 if it's, if you're not really listening to the people you're trying to minister to yeah. then then you shouldn't really expect to have any impact. Yeah. On them, and, and so when when pastors and teachers don't really understand the a whole segment of their their congregation's lives because they don't understand the language, then they have to work a lot harder to yeah. to really engage with the full people, and that, and that that can lead to sort of shallowness uh-huh. um, and maybe just relying on sort of health and wealth. You. you teach yeah. people what they want to hear i can see that I, I can see that it's really it's actually a part of uh sharing your life i mean yeah. paul speaks to the thessalonians about very much in these very f- familial terms yes. we were like fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters yeah. to you. and in other words what he's saying is we we came in and became part of your life yes. in order to bring the gospel to you and and help you to understand it and you responded because it was not like the word of man but as it really was the word of god but that i suppose people use fancy words don't they incarnational and all of that but it yeah. but it is it, it is a reflection ultimately of that isn't it that yes. that god didn't just 
speak his word to us from heaven, that, but the word became flesh yes. and dwelt among us. And in a sense, what you're saying is the word is, is becoming flesh and actually dwelling among people in that they're able to communicate it in the language of their dwelling rather yes. than as a complete outsider. Would that, would yes, that be yes. a helpful way of putting and you, it? And you see, the, you see often around election time in Nigeria, you'll, you'll see uh, politicians driving with their big cars into these remote villages and promising all sorts of empty nonsense and disappearing off again. They just... They arrive, they make empty promises, they maybe throw some money around because they want votes. Yeah. Uh, and it would be too easy as Christian missionaries to do the same sort of thing. The yeah. difference is that the, the gospel hearted person stays around yeah. to share lives yeah. in the way that the politician doesn't really care about the people, they just want no, to He votes. wants to get from the people what yeah. he wants, but the no, gospel serve wants to give. If if yeah. apparent gospel ministers behave in the same way as worldly uh, politicians. Um, so we should be getting to know people, hearing from them, and able to communicate in a meaningful way, mm -hmm. sharing lives in that way. And so Which Bible is hard, it takes time, and, and it, 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 does. it involves giving. Yeah, It involves yeah. sort of spending yourself and throwing yourself away with unimportant, unimpressive people who are made in God's image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the same sort of analogy, isn't it? In that, you know, in today's world, we've got the internet and, you know, you can, you don't have to go to church. You can stay at home and pull down your favorite preacher from your favorite continent, yeah. from your favorite city on your favorite bit of the Bible and cherry pick anything you like and yeah. have far bigger names and more impressive people and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, but actually, it's not the same, is it? That's not to say you can't be helped by things. And of course you can, but... There is no substitute for the real church and the gathering of yes. God's people around his word, which is for that people in that place, in that time, uh, in this way. And, you know, and your church and the word of God through your church is is always going to be a unique thing that you can't have from beamed across from Australia or America or Timbuktu. Yes, and one of the exciting things about uh, working on translating the Bible into everyday language is it really multiplies the gospel workers because suddenly everyone who speaks that language, especially everyone who can read and write that language, can become a gospel partner. They can participate in sharing yeah. the good news yeah. in their families, their communities, in their churches. So it's not just down to one person. So anymore. you've equipped so so you've multiplied you're, you're equipping the, the servants church. of the word by giving yeah. them that word in a way that they're able to, yeah. to, to serve. And, and so just tuning in to uh, less, to more impersonal things from far away, from a yeah. faraway context where all the illustrations are about golf or, or meaningless things like that. Uh, yeah, that, that may be impressive and, and fun mm -hmm. to, in a voyeuristic way, but the Bible in everyday language um, mm -hmm. can actually be so much more striking and, and multiplying the ministry and the ministers by translating it, it is, is a very exciting thing to be part of. Mm -hmm. So really, it's a, it, this is not a luxury. This is not... Um... It's a luxury in the sense that a foundation is a luxury for a house. Yeah, um, you, you might not uh, think about it too much, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it is. It, and it so is in order for there to be more proclamation of the gospel, more teaching of scripture, more actual transformational ministry mm. of God's word um, in these multilingual cultures, uh, if you are leaving out of the equation the, the, the center point of people's actual life, in other words, that part of life which needs to be transformed, if you're, if you're entirely squirreling away anything to do with Christian faith into the realm of commerce or education, you're actually removing the gospel from the very place it needs to be. And, yes, and you're making that kind of real ministry impossible. And, yes. and you're actually, in a way, just perpetuating perversions of the church and sort of superficial Christian-looking things which are not really Christian at all. Yes, and, and, and that should make us think too about how we talk about the gospel, how we read the Bible with our, in our families uh, as well. Do we keep it as, do we keep the gospel just for one sort of area of life or do we let it 
touch yeah. every aspect yeah. of our lives. Uh, for us, it might not be exactly language, um, but yeah, that, that's absolutely true in Nigeria. I, I just remember one time a translator telling me that uh, he, he could see that even in his own life. If, he, if you take me to the city, he said, I'll be a good Christian. If you take me to the village, it's something else. He said, because in the village, uh, as our pastor in Joss says, you know, people are afraid of witches and wizards. And they're, they're not joking. They're, they're mm. deadly serious mm. about these fears that, that keep people away or that make people anxious. And, and so if the gospel invades that very territory that people assume Jesus can't do anything about, then, that, then you can have some real advance or the gospel into people deep into people's lives otherwise it's just a sort of distant sort of something you put on thing almost a yeah. hobby an academic yeah. gown yeah. for wearing in those yeah. cases yeah, yeah. Now that's really really helpful david um it's certainly been very helpful for me uh, chatting with you over uh, re- recent weeks about about some of these issues really helped to clarify um just the value and the worth of of of, of the hard slog of the work that you're doing and um i hope um, our conversation today uh, will be listened to by lots of folk and, and it will help them as well. I do want to say, um, if you've been uh, listening and if you've got other questions, David and Julie are going to be around for about another six weeks or so. Yes, I think uh, so. Yes. If you can catch them, they'll be happy to answer your question. If you have particular questions, do do that. Um, but I hope very much that um, what we've talked about has uh, answered some and uh, has given us all a better insight into uh, into our partnership with them and into how to pray for uh, all the different needs and uh, the different challenges that they meet. So thank you very much, David. Thank you. And uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed uh, listening into this version. Mm-hmm.